That's the constellation of Orion. You will get to know Orion very well this week, okay? All right. Uh, one, I use this slide a lot because it's my standard star slide, and I just copy and paste from PowerPoint to PowerPoint. Uh, number two, you'll see on Wednesday. Um, all right, so the pattern, a familiar pattern there. What I like about Orion is you can see this star up here. Anybody know what that star is called? Betelgeuse, yes. Your kids will often say Betelgeuse, especially if they've seen the Michael Keaton movie, okay? It's not Betelgeuse, it's Betelgeuse. B-E-T-E-L, okay? Betelgeuse. Uh, I'm told that that means armpit of the giant. Um, we just call it the, the shoulder of Orion. Um, all right, uh, you can see what color do we see with Betelgeuse? Yellow, orange. We call it a red supergiant, but you can see it's not really red. We'll get there. Okay, this one down here, does anybody know that one? That's Rigel, okay? Rigel is the knee of Orion, okay? Here's his belt, and hanging down from the belt is the sword of Orion, okay? Um, you can see, he's, all right, up here is Taurus the Bull. Anybody know what this star, the bright star in Taurus is? Okay. Astronomy professor, uh, astronomy, <laughs> astronomy teacher, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't have this on, thank you. Okay. Uh, astronomy teacher, hold. Anybody, anybody else? Okay, hit it. Aldebaran. Aldebaran. All right, up in Taurus the bull, the eye of the bull. All right, and that has sort of a, this reddish orange glow to it. Most of the other bright ones have this bluish glow to them, okay? So you can see that we do see different colors of stars, um, not amazingly strongly different. Do we see any green stars here? Or purple stars here, you can sort of say, well, maybe I see some yellowish type stars. Not a really strong variety. But what we got to do is take a look at what does starlight tell us. Okay, first thing we're going to do is temperature. Okay, how hot it is. How to measure how hot it is without touching it. Okay, because this is not something you want to, like the stovetop, you don't really want to go and touch it. Uh, worse than the stovetop, you can't even touch it. Okay, so I already discussed this image. Let's move on. Uh, this is an image that Zoltz showed you. Okay, and here we have some strongly red and some strongly blue stars here. What's the difference here? Temperature. It's temperature between the red and the blue. It's also the image processing. Um, I will tell you a secret about this image. All right, this image. Um, contains very little visible light, okay? This is a combination of ultraviolet filters and infrared filters. Of course, there is some visible light in, 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 in those filters and such. The blue things are bright in ultraviolet. The red things are bright in infrared. So the image processing that Zolt or somebody else did on this, probably Zolt, was to take the ultraviolet, throw it into the blue channel, take the infrared, throw it into the red channel, combine them, um, and this is what you get. All right, so this is not a real image of how the human eye would see. It is a real image in that the colors do represent wavelengths observed by Hubble, okay? But I like it because it has such a strong contrast, and we'll use it uh, later on, um, but I don't like it because it also, um, uh, it, it, it overemphasizes colors that, 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 aren't, that aren't really there, okay? All right, so when you go into your textbook and you look for uh, astronomy star classification, you get the famous sequence OBAFGKM. Um, uh, what does the OBAFGKM, how do you memorize that? Do you, do you teach your students anything? No. Okay, back when we were sexist pigs, uh, in astronomy because it was dominated by males. It, they, they used to say it stood for OBA fine girl kiss me um, because astronomers, you know, are very anti, are not very social people anyways. Um, with Berkeley, when I, at Berkeley, <laughs> at Berkeley I worked with a gentleman named Alex Filipenko um, and we turned it into, oh boy, Alex Filipenko gives killer midterms. Uh, which was a warning to the folks who thought that astronomy was an easy science to take um, and that it would be an easy A, no, you're not going to get it. The uh, worst students, by the way, were the pre-med students um, because they had to get an A in every class, you know. Um, and sometimes they were taking astronomy to think, oh, well, i got to fulfill the science requirement. All right. Now, when you see it in your textbooks, you will see this bright blue for the O stars and this bright red for the M stars which harkens back to that image I just showed you that was faked, 
not faked, but over-exaggerated, over, over right? Okay, well, what do they really look like? If you take the temperature of the star and you pass it through the cones of the eye that are sensitive to, as we said, red, green, and blue, okay? It's the, it's the cones in your eye. The true colors look more like this, okay? So there is some bluishness to it, all right? Um, there's not much reddishness to it. There's not much yellowishness to it, although the, the M star starts to get orangey, yellowishly thing there, okay? Um, and, you know, that's not the colors that we will draw in the textbooks, okay? How do we arrive at these colors? Well, these colors are proportional to temperature. You can see underneath here we've got the temperature classes listed here. Let me just give you a diagram that makes it much, more, much easier to understand. All right, this is your standard black body curve, okay? How many people are familiar with the black body curve? All right, three of you. Great. The rest of you, uh, let me uh, talk, talk about it. The idea of a black body is that if you heat something up and just let it emit light, okay, the temperature of something at a certain, the, the, the color, the wavelengths of light that would be emitted by something that is glowing, simply glowing, uh, and they call it a black body as in that there's no light hitting onto it, it's just the emission. There's no reflection, no refraction, no other thing. It's just pure emission. And the idea is if you put it inside a black box and open a hole, what, what, what would be the light that would come out if it were just glowing inside there, right? All right, so the, that, that, that black body idea is what is the color, the pure colors that come from something glo only glowing, right? And so if it's at 7,000 degrees Kelvin, okay, it would have this characteristic curve. And at 6,000 degrees Kelvin, it would have this curve. And at 5,000 and at 3,000, okay? They're all the same mathematical function, but with a different temperature put into that function, all right? Um, and when you scale them together, you will notice that everywhere the 5,000 degree curve is above the 3,000 degree curve. And at all wavelengths, the 6,000 is above the 5,000, and the 7,000 is above the 6,000. One of the properties is that as you crank up the temperature, the amount of emission at every single wavelength increases. The other thing you will notice is that the peak of the curve shifts to lower wavelengths and higher energies, the higher the temperature. Okay? Increase the temperature, more energy, right? Okay? The peak of it shifts to higher energies. Higher energies are also shorter wavelengths, right? We'll, we'll go through that again uh, at one point. Okay, so at 3,000 degrees Kelvin, the peak is actually out here in the infrared. At 5,000, it moves into visible. 6,000, it's invisible. And at 7,000, it's starting to move toward the ultraviolet. You get up to 10, 20, 30,000 degrees, which there are star temperatures up to 30 to 50,000 degrees. The peak of it is going to be out in the ultraviolet, which is why those stars actually end up looking blue because the peak is out here in the ultraviolet. We can't see ultraviolet. We, however, see this, this, the, the, the curve down here, which in, across the visible peaks over here to the blue-violet end of the spectrum, right? So that's why the star color for a 3,000 degree star, the maximum in the visible light will be on the red end of it. The star color for a 7,000 degree, the maximum will be over on the violet end of it, and it shifts where the maximum is according to the temperature. So the temperature of the star will be reflected by its gross property of what color you will see. All right? So if we go back here, all right, they talk about 3,000 to 6,000 degrees over here, moving up to 10,000 degrees all the way up to 100,000. I usually don't think of the O stars as getting up to 100,000, so I'm going to disagree with this plot here. But, you know, the, I, I don't know where I stole this from. Okay, um, our sun, oh, I know what it is. They're using Fahrenheit. I don't use, nobody uses Fahrenheit? How dare I steal something where they use Fahrenheit? Ah, because I was going to say, our sun is a G star, and no, it's not 9,000 degrees. Our, our sun is 6,000 degrees Kelvin, okay? I apologize. John, make a note that I have to, I have to delete the temperatures off of this slide because, you know, I, Fahrenheit? Oh, sorry. 
emergency. All right, so um, the 3,000 degree stars would be like Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, a red supergiant, um, because it's puffed up to such a large size, its temperature is actually low. Uh, Rigel is a blue supergiant. It is actually a relative, much, much, much smaller. Even though it is a supergiant, it's much, much, much smaller than Betelgeuse. Uh, extremely hot, getting up into the, 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 the 10,000 or 30,000 de uh, deg degree temperature up here. Um, and sun-like stars, uh, sun is essentially a 6,000 degree Kelvin black body. Okay? Um, and what you see, the peak of 6,000 degrees is actually in the green. Okay, um, and which you know prompted you to ask, well, why is it? Why do we always call it a yellow star? And even astronomy in your textbooks, do they call it a yellow star? Yellow yeah, they call it a yellow dwarf star. Okay, the peak is in the green. The, the 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 way we see it with our eyes is white, but we call it a yellow star. Um, I take it because way back when we had this simplistic diagram here. Um, and it just got codified into the way we talk about things. And um, sorry, I apologize. On behalf of all astronomers everywhere, hey, we messed up. Okay, let's move on. All right, so by, just by looking at the color of the star and knowing how to translate those colors, you can translate them into temperature. So if you take the, the light of the star and you spread it out with a spectrograph and you measure intensity as a function of wavelength, you'll get something as resembling this, okay? Now, of course, if you measure it too finely, you'll see those absorption lines and everything, but we'll get to those in just a second. All right, composition. Composition is what you guys just played with. Uh, we take the light of the star, we spread it out into its spectrum, okay? We know that the individual elements uh, uh, have, diff have spe very specific patterns. Uh, do you guys recognize this one? Hydrogen. That is hydrogen. Did you guys play with hydrogen? They play with hydrogen, right? Hydrogen. Hydrogen's lots of fun to play with, okay? Uh, do you recognize this one here? Yeah. Hmm? Argon? This is the second simplest element. Oh. Helium. Helium, okay? Um, and this is, uh, this, this one here is one that you probably won't guess, but you actually just meant, somebody just said it. Yeah. That one's neon, okay? Um, and it has, it, it, it's, I, it's wonderful how it has these, these interesting uh, doublets uh, within it and everything, okay? Hydrogen, helium, and neon, okay? These are produced how? How are these spectral lines produced? It's not enough to know that there are spectral lines. It's important to know how they are produced. Okay, why would you, yeah? How the, the light's produced? produced. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Let's, let me repeat that and, and, and amplify on that. Okay. So when you heat an atom, okay, it gets excited. Oh, boy! I'm excited. I'm an excited atom. But you can see I can jump all around and there's nothing to stop me from jumping wherever I want. In, a, in an atom, we have the electron orbitals, right? You remember, she remember your chemistry classes. You all, they had electron specific orbitals. Electrons can jump from here to here to here to here. Okay, and only can they jump in these specific quantum steps. Okay, quantum theory. All right, sort of, not quite. But the electrons have specific orbitals. All right, so they can jump from level one to level two, or level one to level three. All right, and then when they drop back down, they emit the energy between level three and level one, or between level three and level two, or level two and level one. And the energy levels, the differences between these distinct energy levels are exact and always the same. So this hydrogen alpha here is an electron dropping between level three and level two in a hydrogen atom, okay? This is going from three to two. And then you heat it up, it can jump back up to three. And then when it drops back down, it emits hydrogen alpha, okay? So always, when it goes from 3 to 2, it will emit a wavelength of 652.6 or something like that nanometers. That's how you get that. Same for the rest of these. This is 3 to 2. This is 4 to 2. This is 5 to 2. This is 6 to 2. This is the visible light contains the uh, 
the Balmer series. There's also the Passion series or whatever, going down to one and then another series going down to three, etc. You want to study that, take chemistry. I'm an astronomer. Um, I just know how to use them like this, all right? Same thing occurring in helium, but helium has two electrons, right? So it can have a lot more levels that it can bounce around between. Neon has how many electrons? Something like 10 or 11, I can't remember which. <laughs> All right, look it up on the iPad, okay? It has a lot more electrons, and more electrons allow you more energy states to, to, to bounce between, therefore more um, uh, lines that you can create. Yes? Is there a point where this becomes like it's just too crowded for the lines to really... You would think so, yeah, wouldn't you? Um, but um, I've never seen the spectrum of, of uh, you know, unal hexium or unal pentium or something like that. Um, all of the spectrums, at least the number of lines that fall into the visible light part of the spectrum, the ones we always use in our textbooks are nice and relatively clean like this. Um, you would think that if you had a, a, a million atoms, a million electrons, you would definitely start to, to blend and, and it would become a continuous spectrum. It, lo it would look like a continuous spectrum even though it was composed of discrete, discrete things. Okay? Then it would be actually a lot like the, the rings of Saturn, right? Things that look continuous but are actually discrete. So, or our phonograph, the grooves in a phonograph record, right? Stuff like that. All right, um, so basically by having these distinct energy levels, they, we know that when we see an emission at that wavelength, we're pretty sure we have hydrogen, okay? But what really matters is do you see the pattern, okay, of the various, uh, of the, of the various things. So let's take a look in here. This is not the sun's spectrum, but a drawing of the sun's spectrum taken from a textbook. Um, and you can see various absorption lines. Now, why are these absorption lines when we told you that the sun is at 6,000 degrees? I never said this was going to be easy. All right, you guys thought, thought you were here on vacation having fun for a week, okay? You actually got to think a little bit. Why would they be absorption lines when the sun is hot? Any guesses? Hot's a relative term. Hot's a relative term. Very good. All right. Hot is a relative term. And the sun photosphere is at 6,000 degrees. But the gases above it may not be at 6,000 degrees. OK? And the light passing through the gases in the atmosphere of the sun, not in the main part of the sun, in the atmosphere around the edge of the sun, OK, will be excited by this. And they will be absorbing at those wavelengths. OK? So the sun's light is heating up these atoms. So instead of going from 3 to 2, it's actually going from 2 to 3. And it's absorbing at that frequency. Okay? Both processes can be observable. All right? If it's heated up and you're only seeing the heat uh, of it, then you are seeing the emission. Here, you're seeing the bright sun behind it. All right? So you're seeing it in absorption. Okay? So these are elements in the sun's uh, atmosphere that are absorbing at those specific energies, okay? Uh, take, take this one here in the yellow. Anyone know what that is? Any chemistry teachers? That's a sodium H and K doublet, okay? All right, so if we see that, if you really want to take and see what the sun's spectrum looks like, John and I will take this spectrum, you hold one end, and I will take it and I will stretch it and I will stretch it and I will stretch it, Okay, and I will stretch it. I'll stretch it until it's about a football field in length, and then I'll chop it into pieces, all right, and stack all those pieces up, and I will get that. That is a real spectrum of the sun. Notice that it goes from long wavelength to short wavelength, to short, long to short, long to short, long to short, all the way down to the bottom. So this is a really, really long spectrum chopped into pieces and then stacked with the, the long wavelength at the top and the short wavelength at the bottom. All right? Can anybody see the H and K doublet? Right there. All right? But you can also see a lot more of things here. All right? So by studying this spectrum really, really closely, we can figure out what are the elements in the atmosphere of the sun, okay? What element was discovered in this spectrum, okay? There was an element that was unknown here on Earth. Scientists did not know what it was until they looked at this spectrum of the sun, not this one, but an earlier version of it. 
and did not, and discovered that after they identified the lines, there was still another line, set of lines that they couldn't identify. So the point is, is that you would look at this and you'd say, okay, I'm going to measure here are the wavelengths of all these things. And then I look at my patterns and say, okay, well, hydrogen has this pattern, so I'll subtract out those. And well, they, these are hydrogen lines, and these are sulfur lines, and these are neon lines, or whatever. And then there's another set of lines left over, and they're saying, we don't know about that one. Because we would do the same thing that we do here in the lab. You would heat up the stuff and see what lines it gives off, measure them very carefully, compare them there, and there's still lines left over. Anybody have an idea what the element was that was discovered in the sun? What? Speak up. Helium. helium. The Greek word for sun is helios. Helium, meaning sun, the element of the sun, was discovered in the sun's spectrum before it was discovered here on Earth. Okay? Hence why it's called helium. All right? So, helium was discovered in the sun. Now, here's what you want to take a look at. When we have the spectrum of the sun at 6,000 degrees, it's going to excite only certain lines. All right? But if we heated the sun up to 10,000 degrees, it would, would be able to excite different lines because higher energy transformations could be heated up, right? Or if you cool it down, lower, only lower energy transformations would be able to be heated up, okay? So the spec pattern of spectral lines in the sun is going to be different than the pattern of spectral lines in a cooler star, which is going to be different from the pattern of spectral lines in a hotter star. Make sense? Nod your heads. All right, you want to go to lunch? You got to nod your head to keep me going, okay? All right. So we have this. This is a medium type G2 star. Here is a cool star. Medium star, cool star. There, there are certain things you note the H and K, they stay there, okay? This red line there, that stays there, okay, as we go back and forth. But you'll notice, especially down here, look at all the lines here that aren't really apparent there. Changing the pattern. That changing pattern is actually how we got the OBAFGKM mess. Because we organized them into type A, type B, type C, type D, and so on down the alphabet before we understood what all this meant. Okay? So we had these types and then when we realize, oh, it's related to temperature, which, is which gives us the spectral type of the star, then we reorganized them according to temperature and got OBAFGKM um, instead of getting ABCDEF, which is what we probably would have done because we astronomers are pretty straightforward in how we do our classification. All right, one more star, K Arcturus is a type uh, K star. If we go to an F star, all right, you can see the cool stars actually get not just elements, individual elements, they also get molecules in their atmosphere, okay? Uh, we get, what is it, um, as, as you go down you start getting molecular lines that are excited by these, these quote, quote, low temperatures, all right? You got to recognize to an astronomer, 2,000, 3,000 degrees Kelvin, eh, that's a low temperature, that's a cool star, that's not very hot at all, all right? Uh, Stuff that would fry us um, is, is cool to an astronomer. All right. So, last thing, motion. All right. And this is the one that you're all familiar with already. You know this. You just don't, you may not know that you know this. All right. So, let's talk about a wave propagating from an emitter. So, that circle in the center is the emitter. This is the wave. We can think of, sure, you know, ripples in a pond emitting from that, that central source. And as those waves go out, they stay circular based upon the point of emission, right? So you can see, like the ripples on the pond, they all make this nice circular motion. Now, suppose, however, that that emitter is in motion. Now, you can't do this with a pond. You can't move your, move your center of emission across the pond. But by the time it, before it emits that second wave, it moves slightly to the right. So that first Whip, ripple of emission will stay centered on where it was emitted. The second one will be centered on a point slightly to the right, and the third slightly right of that, the fourth slightly right of that, 
and the fifth slightly right of that. Okay? So each wave is going to be centered on its own emission point due to the motion of the object. So do we have nice circular features? No. Okay. What we do see, however, is that in the direction of motion, the waves are closer together, and anti the direction of motion, the waves are further apart. Okay? So if you were measuring wavelength and you were in front of the object, would you, which would you measure? A shorter or a longer wavelength? Shorter wavelength. If you are behind it, if it's moving away from you, you will measure a longer wavelength. In visible light, shorter wavelengths are blue and longer wavelengths are red. So we speak of this as redshift. Um, redshift over here and blue shift over here. If it's coming towards you, it's blue shifted. If it's going away from you, it is red shifted. Uh, very simple uh, derivation of that terminology. Now, this happens for all light equally, right? So if I've got a star and I'm looking at that spectrum of the star and it's coming toward me, okay, if it's blue shifted, then those spectral lines will also be blue shifted, right? And I can tell by measuring those spectral lines. Those spectral lines give me markers where I can measure that shift. All right, so if I look at the spectral lines, and these are the unshifted lines of the spectrum, if it's going away from me, they'll be shifted a little bit towards the red. And I can measure that. I can say, here's what it should be, here's what I measure. We'll, we have to figure out why it is, and we, we associate that with motion, we can measure the motion of the star. If instead it's blue shifted, that means it's coming toward me, all right, and then we can measure the motion of the star towards us. So when we look at a star, not only do we have to take into account what color it is and get the spectrum of it, but we also have to take into account any motions and recognize that not only includes the motion of the star, but also the motion of the observer. Because are you guys sitting still? Even though you may not be leaving your chairs, you are not sitting still. Right now you are moving at 1300 kilometers a second 1,300 kilometers an hour orbiting around Earth. Earth is moving at around 108,000 kilometers per hour moving through the solar system. Our sun is moving at 220 kilometers per second moving around the center of the galaxy, and the galaxy is moving at like 600 kilometers a second through the universe. We astronomers have to account for all those relative motions, the what, what are, whatever are the rel relevant uh, relative motions when we do these uh, uh, analyses. Okay? Every time we take a spectrum and we measure these spectral lines, we can't measure redshift and blue shift of the star unless we subtract out the redshift and blue ship, shift of the observer. Hubble is moving at 17,000 miles an hour all right, orbiting around Earth. So we've got lots of different motions to take into account. Uh, it's a, not as simple as we always present it. Okay? So I like to give you the details uh, in this. All right. So, our conclusion, analysis of light can tell us temperature, composition, motion, and more. I heard some people discussing cosmological redshift with Zolt after his talk. That's a different thing. It also, it also appears like Doppler shift, but it's not actual physical motion. It's the expansion of the universe. We'll discuss that on Thursday. Any questions?